Hey, this is Joe Mastriona, better known as Joe M, co-host of Life After Fame podcast with my best friend, Joe Boglino, better known as Joe B. Yep, we're the two Joes. Thanks for being here today. If you've already subscribed to the show, thank you so much and a big shout out to our Life After Fame tribe. We love you guys. If you're here for the first time, well, welcome. Make sure you subscribe to the show because today, like in every episode, we're bringing you the most amazing transformational stories of former pro athletes, coaches, musicians, and actors. Very people who have achieved the extraordinary. We share with you where they are now, what they're doing, and the challenges of transitioning and beginning a life outside of the arena and or stage. So buckle up, Life After Fame listeners, because this is going to be an amazing ride. Let's do this. Welcome to Life After Fame Podcast. Just imagine 70,000 fans cheering your name when you've scored the winning touchdown. Imagine standing on stage looking out at the crowd, rocking out to that chart-busting song you created. The applause and recognition you received for your masterful acting performance in that latest blockbuster movie. And then, one day, the cheering stops. This podcast is all about catching up with these stars of yesterday to find out where they're at now and who they are as people beyond the stardom. This is a true human interest podcast about the people we love to root for. And now your hosts, Joe Mastriona and Joe Boglino. Life After Fame's guest this week is former NFL player and two-time Super Bowl champion of the Denver Broncos, Glenn Cadrez. Glenn had a very successful career in the NFL, playing 11 seasons with three different teams before hanging it up on his terms at the end of the 2002 season. Glenn takes us back in a time to a couple of his biggest plays as a pro football player, and one specifically where he gives us a piece of advice that is absolutely a golden nugget of how to create your big break in life. Cadrez discusses the differences between the locker room and teammates compared to the challenges of business partners in the regular world. In this episode, you will see Glenn for who he really is, an amazing dad of five, a successful businessman, and a regular human being, just like you and me. Finally, in this episode, he shares with us his excitement about his new business venture, in the real estate market, which is both fun and creative. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Life After Fame and The Seat, Glenn Cadrez. Thanks for being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Glenn, I want to jump into a play that sticks out in our minds as one of your biggest plays in your career. You had a lot of them, but I'd like to, because I think this is a very unique story. Can you talk to us about the interception that you made was a game-saving interception against the Seattle Seahawks in that 98 season when you guys were going for back-to-back -back Super Bowls with the Denver Broncos. Sure. We still talk about it when I get together with the guys. What made it special was it was the game before the bye week, and Mike had told us if we win the game, we get a week off. So if you could get a week off in the middle of an NFL season, it's very much anticipated and rejoiced. So playing Seattle, they were fourth quarter. They were driving on us. We always played Seattle. They were always tough. On us. They had a play that was a drag with Galloway where he would come across the middle. But to do that, they would max protect, and they would have literally seven guys on the line blocking. So we had called a blitz, and I had blitzed in. I was engaged with the guard, and I noticed that the tackle and the ends, everyone was staying in blocking. So I was like, oh, they're running this play. So I look over to my side, see Galloway make his cut down the middle and so I just stayed with my guy stayed with my guy pushed off of him and creeped back into the center back into the hole and sure enough he throws it I reach my arm out grab a little one-hander lay on the ground my teammates literally pick me up and carry me into the locker room like I had plenty of tickets and now I can go see yeah. my mom go see this so it was just one of the it was just awesome because we got that week off and so that kind of made it pretty sweet that's great it was also due keep the streak going at that time of undefeated. But I love that you really highlighted the really important part was just having that week off. The NFL, it's a grueling sport and you get time off to rest your body. And then most importantly, you get to go back and see your family. It was a minute 56 remaining in the game. 
and they were on the 28 yard line of the Broncos. And when you made the interception, now there's a little more to that story that I'd like to highlight because I think that this is a really unique and cool aspect. So John Mobley had injured his hamstring the night before. Do you remember that Glenn and how he did that? I don't. I okay. Really don't. I'll see if I can refresh your memory. John had hurt his hamstring because he was sitting in a seat and the chair broke and he hurt his hamstring. And so, cause you were playing middle linebacker and I believe they substituted you in for Mobley cause it was still bothering him at that time and he couldn't run it. So I think they had put you in at weak side linebacker and that's when you were blitzing. And then you fell back, like you said, into the coverage, made the interception and what I wanted to highlight was everything happens for a reason. And you were meant for that interception. As Bronco fans, we still are <laughs> loving you as well as all the players were. I thought that was a really cool aspect to it. Mobley didn't just get hurt in like a game. He actually got hurt from a darn chair breaking on him the night before is the background story of that. Yeah, I vaguely remember there was a freak accident that John tweaked his hand. So I don't remember exactly what it was, but I do remember that. I don't know if, because I was starting at Mike at the time, so I don't know if I had switched over. I think we might have thrown Nate Wayne there. I can't remember that part, but I just know that it was a great time for Broncos to rejoice and get that week off. My sister actually was a counselor at a Bill Gates' kid's school and she was a counselor there. And so she just got, they, the papers were all, could dread ruins this or whatever. And so <laughs> Oh, are you hit? Are you heard? You know that guy? That's no, I don't know him at all. No, I've never <laughs> met him. I don't even oh, know who that, that is. So, Glenn, well, how old were you when you started? When you first started playing sports? I was eight. I played Pop Warner at eight years old. I have two boys now. I didn't let them play until they're twelve. One's twelve. This is his first year. But yeah, I started at eight years old. So you started when you were eight, and the day comes when you're at the University of Houston, and it's draft day. Probably something that you had an ambition for your whole life, playing professional ball. You'd probably have to tell me that. I would assume so. But talk to us about that day. You're wrapping up your college career, and now you have a chance to go to the NFL. What was that day like for you? And then what was it particularly like to be drafted by the Jets? They weren't so good at the time, but did it matter? Yeah. Well, that whole draft thing, it's such a racket. There's a lot that goes into it. I didn't go the combine. So I played defensive end in college and I would get personal workouts because we had a very good quarterback that went fifth pick in the draft. David Klingler went to the Bengals. So teams would come in to see him. And then our special team coach, which was a strength coach, was a good friend of mine. And he said, hey, you should try working out this guy. He's a linebacker, but he's just playing defensive end because we needed him there. So they would start working me out and I started getting four fives and I ran a three nine shuttle and I just things like that. And they were I started slowly, gradually getting on the radar without going to combine. And I flew up Buffalo and Levy, the head coach at the time, he was like, Here you go. We got you at the sixth round. You're going in the sixth round with us. Mel Kuyper was, ah, you're going the sixth round. So the first day, we had two days back then, we were, it was 12 rounds, and the first day, I went to some friend's house, had a barbecue, played poker. I didn't even watch it. I was like, I don't, who knows what's going to happen, right? It's not going to be me. And the second day, I woke up, I started watching draft on TV, and it just had started, and I see Buffalo have maybe 17 picks away. And I get a call, and I'm like, oh, this must be Buffalo, and it's Miami. And Miami says, we're going to take you in the sixth round. So I look, I'm like, wow, Miami's right before Buffalo. So I look, go to Miami. And I'm like, okay, cool. Don Shula, Dan Marino. I'm like, great, awesome. Hang up the phone. And literally about five, 10 minutes later, phone rings. I'm thinking it's Miami. I go, hello. And it's Pete Carroll. And he's, we just drafted you, New York Jets. And I'm like, New York Jets? What? And he's, are you excited? I'm like, how did you find me? What are you talking about? I thought I was going to Buffalo. <laughs> I was going to Miami. And I end up at the bottom of the barrel with the jet. So mm. I was there for three years and it was an opportunity. So I just looked at it as a great opportunity, a chance to play in the NFL. Glenn, would you, out of those three, which one would you, if you had your choice, would it have been the Dolphins because of the team and probably because of nice weather? You're from California, so it's similar weather. Would it be that one yeah. or was it the Buffalo Bills because of Levy? 
Well, at the time, Buffalo had already gone to two Super Bowls, and then they went to two more. They were the big dogs in the AFC. So, yeah. I mean, I went to Buffalo. I was fine because I would have had a chance to go to the Super Bowl. But, yeah, Miami's always nice weather, and playing with Dan Marino and that kind of stuff would have been fun. But before we, we talk about your transition from New York to the Broncos, you had mentioned before we came on air here about – maybe the biggest personal play of your career. And that had to do with a preseason game with the Jets. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I coach my kids' Pop Warner team. And one of the stories that I tell them, and a lot of high school kids that I go and talk to, you just, you never know. Keep your head down, you keep working, and you just, you never know. I came into the Jets. I was a six-round pick. We drafted a linebacker in the fourth round and the second round. We had, we drafted Mo Lewis last year in the second round. Hmm. I mean, we were stacked at linebacker. I was third string. I wasn't even getting a real look. I was getting a look at on special teams, which I excelled, and I was really mistake-free throughout the camp. Because my motto was, if I don't give them a reason to cut me, how are they going to cut me? So I was never late. I, every step was right. Every hand placement, every lane I ran in on the kickoff or whatever it was, I did it right to where the special team coach one day said, who the hell is number 50? And I said, that's me. And he goes, well, who are you? Where are you from? And all this. And he said, this guy never makes mistakes. And so I started to gradually rise up on the special team chart. But the day before the game, I was going to play. I was third. I was going to get some run like in the fourth quarter. And Greg Robinson calls me in or Pete, I think it's Pete, calls me in. And he said, hey, we're having a problem with Joe Kelly in the contract. He's not going to play. Mo Lewis, is his ankle or something, he's not going to play much. He's going to play one series. You're going in the first quarter. And you're going to go in at Will Linebacker, which I hadn't played throughout the whole camp or mini camps. So I'm like, oh my, I went back to the hotel room. I'm studying the Will Linebacker. I'm writing plays on my hand, my wrist, I'm everything. And I get in there and I just said, hey, just play. And lo and behold, I, I end up picking off a ball for 73 yards and I outran the receiver into the end zone. And John Madden was doing the game and he was like, that's either the fastest linebacker or the slowest receiver. I don't know what. <laughs> I like the next game they said okay you know what we're gonna keep you at will and the next game I had a pick against Favre he had just gotten to to Green Bay from Atlanta so now I had two picks in two games and I'm playing a different position and they were like you can play a lot of different things you're solid on special teams I knew then that I was going to make the team so that was my story and then I was fortunate enough to play 11 years and I never I was never released I never went to training camp and got cut so that's a good thing Let's talk about the transition from you played a couple of years with the Jets and then you get traded to the Denver Broncos. First question is, was Greg Robinson responsible for that? Because he had coached you at the Jets and now he's the defensive coordinator for the Broncos. Did he ever talk to you about that, Glenn? Was he part of the reason why they went after you because he knew you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100% he was responsible. I mean, there were some injuries with the Broncos, the linebacker core, right. and then they had gotten some free agents that year that just really didn't pan out as they thought. And I had, what had happened was I had begged and begged to be released before the season started by the Jets. I was like, this is not working. Please let me go. And they, so they said, listen, we're going to wait till the third week. We're going to try out these rookies. If they pan out, we'll let you go. I'm like, great, good. So they let me go the third week. I go to literally that Tuesday, that night, I went to Cincinnati. I'm sitting there in front of Cindy Brown, and she gives me a two-year contract. And I said, no, thank you. And she's, well, you're not going to get paid this week. And I said, listen, I'm not doing it. If I'm going to play in this league, I'm going to play where I'm happy, where they're, it's a good organization. I just, I had enough of the New York Jets. I don't know what their organization's like now, but I know in the early 90s, it was terrible. You didn't even feel like you're a pro. So I wasn't about to go from the frying pan to the pot. And I told him, I said, no, thanks. So I literally went back home, took my wife out to Central Park. We cruised around on Sunday, didn't, didn't do anything, didn't worry about it. I said, oh, there'll be offers. And that Monday, I had a one-year deal in Houston, Jack Pardee, which was my old coach in college. And I was going to go to Houston. And as I was taking a shower, I was drying off. My phone rings. It's my agent. He's Denver Want You. I said, say no more. Send me to Denver. I'm going to Denver. And I went to Denver. I knew that Greg was there. I knew the defense. I grew up in California, AFC West. So I was like, I'm coming home. It's AFC West. Walked into the locker room. First person that walked up to me was Steve Atwater. He says, hey, buddy, let's go win some Super Bowls. And I said, I finally made it in the NFL. Hmm. And then that was it. So it's interesting because to achieve such level, you almost would just do anything to maintain where you're at and who you're with. 
but yet you were, you were crossing the line with your own personal principles and you had just had it and you didn't care. It almost sounds like you didn't care if you played again. You felt confident that you would, but if you didn't play again, you didn't play again and you'd move on with your life. Well, I mean, you kind of understand the business of the NFL. And I had three years. I was very productive in special teams. I was a young linebacker that could play multiple positions. I knew that I would get a shot. I knew that somebody, and I had four teams that worked me out that offered me a deal. So I knew that I would get a shot. And then my mindset is once I'm there, it's up to me. And I just had the confidence. I'm not going to go in there and make mistakes. I'm not going to go in there and know what I can do. And sure enough, I went to Denver. I was there that Tuesday. We fly out Saturday to Seattle. Linebacker gets hurt in the first quarter. I go in. I play the rest of the three quarters and then I end up starting seven games and then that's my Denver was my home. So you had mentioned that you had never been cut. Maybe that day coming up, there might've been some concerns. I don't know how it is for all players, but let's talk about the last days of your career, which ended up in Kansas city. What was going through your mind as you began to prepare for a life after football, doing something completely different than what you were used to doing up until that point? Honestly, I mean, I can talk about it now. It's been 20 years. I really feel like my retirement began when I was no longer a Bronco. And I spoke with Mike and I knew where it was going. I was going into my 10th year. We had drafted Wilson. We had it was a young Ian Gold. There was a lot of young linebackers that were coming up. And a lot of us that won Super Bowls, we were kind of starting to get weeded out. We were getting older and that's just the nature of the business. So I realized that. And so I was offered Cleveland and Oakland. And then Greg Robinson went to Kansas City. And so he's like, hey, come over here. You're going to be a player coach. We've got some young guys we want you to bring along, help out. You're going to play on nickel. You're still going to run that spinner package that we ran for years and years in Denver. And I said, okay, great. And then it ends up, there were some injuries, and I ended up starting a few more games than I thought I would. But I, Dick Vermeil was awesome. It was just bizarre playing in that red because they were such a rival to us. And I was just, you know, like, we're Broncos. Like my whole family, like we're, we're, we bleed Bronco now. I'm on a text chain with 30 of my Bronco friends. Every Friday we text each other and talk shit about each other and all that kind of stuff. So, but I wasn't quite ready to retire, but mentally I was. And so I went to a familiar place, AFC West, a coach that I'd been around and I just ended it there. But for the most part, I mean, it really felt like my career was over when I left Denver. I wasn't mentally the same player. I was more of a coach on the field trying to bring along the younger guys. So when you're going through that in that season in Kansas City, Glenn, of course, I'm, I would imagine thoughts start to pop into your head like, okay, what's next? What am I going to do? What am I good at? What can I transition into? And I know you did have some transitions. So first year after you retired, you were co-host in a sports talk show and did that for a year, as well as with your college buddy in Houston, you guys started a film production uh, mm -hmm. called Bloodworks. And so tell us about that transition. And was that going on in your mind? Like, hey, I want to get into film. I want to get into broadcasting or did it just happen naturally? Well, I did for KBPI in Denver, the rock station with Uncle Nasty and those yep. guys did morning blitz with Kadrez. And it was like every Friday I would go on there. So I got a taste of radio and I really enjoyed it. So I'm retired. I had a bar and restaurant back home. So I ran that. I was just bored and I said, you know what? I want something where I can interact with all the high school kids, keep them up to date, keep people up to date what's going on in high school. And then let's dive into pros. And so I would have tons and tons of pros and coaches would be on the show. It was a really a great show. I actually did it for two years. And then we stopped doing that and I started getting into, as far as blood works, my buddy called me. He's like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to start this. I'm like, dude, I don't know anything about this stuff. He goes, oh, you'll learn. Which, by the way, he's a pretty big producer now. He does a lot of big movies now in Hollywood stuff. But I got into it, but I didn't know anything about film or anything like that. And I was just like the guy that would go in and we would do a money raise and I would talk about, oh, he's a Ex Bronco. Yeah, it just it wasn't my thing. So I started doing different things, different projects. And the transition, I think the hardest part of the transition for a pro athlete, especially a pro athlete that's in a team sport, is that we are programmed to believe in the guy next to us. That's my brother. That's that guy has my best interest. That guy's gonna do whatever he can to help us win. And I'm gonna do the same. 
And when you get into business, it's really not like that. There's a lot of lying, deceit, a lot of things that they say that they're really not, and they don't really care about winning as a team. They just care about getting their pockets fat. And so I, I experienced a lot of that going into business with people. And I'm just, but you said this and you said, and, but wow, I mean, you, it's not that team atmosphere. So I think a lot of pro athletes, they come into business and they want to do well. They want to create a market in their business or whatever it is that they're doing. But the people around them aren't necessarily have their best interests. They're out for themselves. They're out to push your name, push your product to try to fatten their pockets. And so that was the one thing that I found like very alarming and very disappointing to where I was like, I think I'm going to be done with this. I think I'm going to just get some housing product and, and rent the houses or some condos or something and just call it a day. So that's the biggest transition for me was the people side of it. It sounds like you felt because you had some fame to you. You're an ex NFL player. Oh, I'm just going to leech onto him and use his name to, like you said, fatten their pockets and their business. Is that kind of the overall feeling of what was happening? Yeah. Like they use your name and what you've done in the past with sports just to get into the door. And then once they're in the door, they can kind of yeah. do their skill and all that kind of stuff. So sure. yeah, it was just, I mean, and I know a lot of guys that, that have dealt with that and whether it's your agent or manager or whatever, it just happens all the time. So we had a group in Colorado that had a bunch of, I mean, they were just not who they said they were and weren't after the main goal. I mean, it wasn't a team thing. It was him. It was like, Hey, we're going to use you guys as a stepping stone and we're going to get here. And then once we're in the door, it's every man for himself. And we're going to, you know, so that was the yeah. big and the hardest learning experience getting to football because football, I mean, you're a team. You're like I said, we still talk every week, like 30 of us. We have our 25th anniversary coming up in October 23rd. I guarantee everyone will be there. Like everyone will be there. We're all be hugging and drinking together and talking about old times and all that. So that camaraderie and that kind of that friendship, we don't want to let each other down. And that's just not the way it is in business. Yeah. It, it's a big reason, even though Joe and I didn't play professional sports, not even close. I was all neighborhood once, all neighborhood playing hoops, but that's about <laughs> as close as I got. But you touched upon something that is really what we're focused on is you guys are just people. You, you just achieve something extraordinary through hard work, dedication. Maybe you had some breaks, but it has to be difficult to constantly be labeled as, okay, there's the athlete and what can I get from them and that type of thing. And through all of this, Glenn, so not only were you in your thirties transitioning to a professional career, finding your way through things, but you also had some transition within your personal life at home. What kind of lessons learned can you offer to our audience about all of that you had to go through and that you maneuvered around and look, you're alive and well today, you're still standing. So, you know, how did you persevere through all that? What did you use? What'd you lean on? I mean, life has been a lot of different ups and downs. I have three wonderful daughters that are grown. I have two little boys. My family life has always been just, I couldn't ask for more. A great relationship with all my kids. And I just, I love them to death and we're very close. The business side, yeah, there was shortcomings there. I learned to just walk away and move on. My personal life as far as being married, I was married young. That just it didn't work. I don't think it would have worked if I was a teacher or anything else in any other profession. It just so happened that we were just some young kids. But I think football's definitely been my teacher in life to just keep getting up, keep going forward. And if this business doesn't work or this relationship doesn't work, you just keep on going and keep your family first. You know, I've always, everything I've done, I've always kept my family first. Well, and that's the Any thing, isn't it? That you, your family goes through these transitions as well. So you've got these kids watching you be a professional ball player and then you, you have to leave it. So how do you, they probably roll with the punches. Kids are resilient. How'd you bring them through those points of transition with you as you made the, the conversion from um, to ordinary life? My, when I played, my girls were obviously babies and growing up in Denver and all that. And they were, let's see, my oldest was like four and then she was 10 when we left Denver or 11. So they never really, daddy was never, he played football, but he wasn't a football player. He was daddy. So I don't think it was ever. And they ran around with all the other kids, Christian McCaffrey and all these other little kids. I think 
every kid was just like, that's my dad. Oh, and he also plays football. I don't think it was like, oh, that's, he's this. And I think that goes even with like an Elway. I mean, obviously an Elway who's done a great job maintaining that with his kids that he's just a dad. But he, I mean, if you've ever been around that guy, like at a place in Denver, I mean, he's knows John. It's it's constant bombarding. And I was in a bar one time and we were sitting there and I swear to you, he had seven glasses of wine lined up, full glasses of wine from people just sitting there. Buy him drinks. Yeah. <laughs> it's wise because they want to he thank you and they want to say, oh, do you mind if I get a picture? Well, you know, he lived a completely different life than yeah. live. In my hometown, I had a little more fame that was bothersome where it was like, I would have dinner with my kids and they'd say, oh, sign this and do this. But this guy was like everywhere in the country he went. I'm just in El Centro. They knew who I was more, more or less. But so there's different degrees. And I just think you got to maybe it's the fact that I had girls. I mean, maybe if my two boys were in, in the mix at the time I was playing, they probably would look at it a little different. But my girls were just like, eh, whatever. They didn't even play sports. So it wasn't a big deal them. So talk to us now, Glenn, about what you're currently doing with real estate. I know you had mentioned that you're into real estate now. Are you an investor? Are you a realtor? Are you both? What are you doing? You know what? I have some ground and I'm going to put up some some of these small homes. It's a it's zone for trailer park, but instead of the trailers, I'm going to put up these modern, these new little tiny uh, homes. Are you tiny, tiny homes? homes? Tiny homes, yeah. With the uh, with the solar already built yeah. in in and all that kind of stuff so it's really kind of state of the art you can just go in and everything's all there and it's you're not taking power from the grid you're just i'm getting into that and building that out back in my hometown that's so, great and yeah. you're in temecula california is that correct I, yeah yeah, yeah. Be- beautiful place lots of vineyards and perfect mm-hmm. for tiny homes are you going to decide to keep the tiny homes and rent them out or are you going to sell them to people or i've got 38 it's well this is in my hometown of el centro i'm going to do five acres of the tiny homes i'm talking to another like a storage facility place to do there's a lot of like land and sand dunes in the river. So storing trailers and boats and all that. And then I just, I'm talking to, I don't know if it's out in Denver, but it's Soapy Suds. It's like a, it's like a, it's a station service station, gas station, car wash. They want to do like the hydrogen, electric and gas type station. So we're talking to them to come in and just pretty much it's right off the freeway. And we just want to have a nice stop center. It's right between Arizona as you're getting out of Arizona. So just a place to charge up, fuel up, grab some snacks, whatever you want to do. And then also on the other side, we're going to have the housing. So one more question for you, Glenn, how does the body hold up after 50, after what you put it through in your twenties and your teens? Well, I do plan on moving out of this house because it's two stories. I'm tired of stairs. I'm getting a one. I'm going to build a one story house and be done with it. So there there's definitely things that it takes its toll And I have to do things that identify my age, let's say. Like I wear Hoka shoes. Have you guys seen those Hoka shoes? No. They're like no. What are they? They're like Cadillacs. And I mean they're just super soft. And I have a I have a cane that pops into a chair. So when I'm coaching my kids, I can sit down and little little things like that. I go down to I go down to Mexico like once every two months. I get an IV. I get stem cell. I do yoga. Of course, we talked about that. I just do. I eat right. I still exercise. I still play racquetball twice a week. So I'm very active for 52, but I definitely feel it. And I just take the precautions that need going into it. That's great. I can't imagine after an NFL career that your body's pretty beat up. And it sounds like you're doing a great job of taking care of it now and for the future. And of course, for yourself and for your family, for your kids. You want to be around for a long time for them. That's awesome. Glenn, one last question. If there was one thing that you would do over in your career, your life up to this point, what would it be differently? Oh man. Like you realize when you get older, like this butterfly effect of your life, like one little, this, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I remember I was, I had two kids. I was 24 and Cincinnati puts this two year contract in front of me and I was out of work and I was able to thank God to say, I'm not going to do it. And then the next week, the injuries come and then I go to Denver. So I'm sure glad I did that. But there, there's also other ones, I think, that maybe, I don't know. I, that, that's a tough question. I was offered to be traded my 
I played six years in Denver. Going into my sixth year, I think it was. It was after the Super Bowl. Mobley got hurt the first game. I moved to Will. Al Wilson moved to Mike. So I played that year at Will. And after that year, I had a pretty good year, 100 tackles, seven sacks, and I was going to be traded to Green Bay. And I saw the writing on the walls that we've got Al. He came in, played awesome. I knew he was going to be the starting Mike. John was still young. So I was. that might have been something that it, the timing probably would have been good for me to take that trade. But I had my kids were so embedded in the Denver schools and what sure. we were doing. And I just yeah. loved it. And I was like, I told Mike, no, nah, I don't want to be traded. And so he traded Nate Wayne to him. And he had a he ended up having <laughs> over there. That's um, great. He gave you the option, though. Mike's a classy guy. I mean, he gave you the option as opposed to just trading you and saying, see you later. Thanks for all your hard work. He gave yeah. you the option. I think yeah. that's a classy I, move. I, I'll tell you what, man. He definitely built those teams. I mean, and we were like, when you really look at it, I mean, we dominated the NFL for two solid years. Really, I mean, just three, three, three Jackson, years, in our three, opinion, three yeah. years. And he brought all that together. He's a shrewd businessman, but he knows what to, he knows how to build a team. We had great coaches. We had a great organization. We had a great owner. Everything just came together to make to make up that team, and it shows in the record. Well, Glenn. We're going to end there. We want to thank you so much for being on today. It's been fantastic to just catch up with you and then also learn more about you as a human being, as a guy that's achieved extraordinary goals in your professional career as an NFL player, but also as an outside your life and your personal life. It sounds like you're an amazing dad and have some great ventures coming up with real estate and the things you've done. So we really, really appreciate you being on. Thank you so much. Well, I'll tell you what, it was all my pleasure. I really appreciate it, guys. We want to thank 11-year NFL pro and two-time Super Bowl champion Glenn Cadrez for joining Life After Fame. Incredible to understand the break he got to make the team and the career he made out of it. We really want to thank you as well for listening today. We appreciate all of our listeners and all of your support. Life After Fame is not just about celebrity. It's a show about life. Ordinary people like you and me who've achieved extraordinary and how they transitioned out of the spotlight. We hope you enjoyed the interview. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit the subscribe button to find out about previous episodes and brand new interviews to come. Please visit us at lifeafterfamenow.com and subscribe to the show anywhere podcasts are found. Join us next week as we're going to have another great guest tell their story of how they made the transition from the spotlight to their life after fame. On behalf of this episode's guest, former NFL pro Glenn Cadrez, I'm Joe Boglino with my co-host Joe M. Embrace the transition in your life knowing you are not on an island anymore with life after fame. See you next week.